I thought we'd begin. The translation I, I'm handing out has a lot of the Middle English flavor of the cloud of unknowing. It's harder to understand sometimes, like the word ghostly actually comes from uh, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's the English word for spirit. <clears throat> but I like it because it's very, it gives you the sense that this was written around the time of Chaucer. And then in two weeks, we'll be doing Julian of Norwich, who's writing it around exactly the same time. So um, the, uh, the translation or the edition that I used is somewhat awkward sometimes, but I, but I think it gets uh, a really nice flavor of the writing. So I thought we'd begin this morning with the, the very first paragraph is kind of our opening meditation. It's an exhortation to lift up our hearts. Lift up thine heart unto God with a meek stirring of love, and mean himself and none of his goods. And thereto look the loath to think on aught but himself, so that not work in thy wit, nor in thy will, but only himself. And do that in thee, is to forget all the creatures that ever God made and the works of them, so that thy thought nor thy desire be not directed nor stretched to any of them, neither in general nor in special, but let them be and take no heed to them. This is the work of the soul that most pleases God. Amen. Well, the, the, the work we're considering today is uh, work in English, uh, which is unusual. So uh, Bernard of Clairvaux wrote in Latin, and so this is uh, the, the beginning, actually, of vernacular theology. Uh, we'll read, uh, we'll talk two weeks from today, I'm, an, I'm not here next week, two weeks from now we'll do Julian of Norwich, who's writing at the same time in English, as I mentioned. Uh, the interesting thing about the cloud of unknowing is we don't know who wrote it. Uh, it's part of several works. One being the English translation of Pseudo Dionysius's uh, mystical theology, and so that was translated earlier into Latin, and then the, the author of the Cloud of Unknowing translates it into English, and so it makes a huge impact just by having the mystical theology tra translated into English. And he's clearly drawing from Pseudo Dionysius, who talks about knowing by unknowing. Um, the other thing, we don't know where this person was, but we're pretty sure, well, he's obviously in England, we're pretty sure he was a Carthusian. And the Carthusians are a really interesting order in that they're a combination of communal and hermit life. Uh, they were started by uh, St. Bruno in around 1050, I believe, in the town of Chartreuse. Um, and, they, and they would set up these houses, sometimes right on the outskirts of urban areas, so they were not way out in the middle of nowhere the way the Cistercians were. Uh, and they had a very interesting design to them. And the, the Carthusians, actually, there's a Latin saying the Carthusians have is never reformed because never deformed. <laughs> so unlike the Benedictines, who were constantly undergoing reform, in fact, the word reformation starts with orders who are reforming themselves. We'll see with Luther and Calvin and others in March that term gets extended, but it actually starts in the monastic orders, and the Carthusians were very proud of the fact they never had one reform movement because they didn't need it. And so Bruno, you know, he, he's creating this order hundreds of years, 500 years after Benedict, and so he could see sort of where the pitfalls were and where the strengths were, but if you, if you know anything about the order, it's fantastic. They have a cloister where the, 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 uh, the senior sort of hermits live, and they're usually 12 to 20 of these, and they're, and they're uh, two-story units, they're not cells, they're two-story units surrounded by a garden, backing up to a common cloister, but they face out away from the cloister. And so each father who's living there lives as a hermit, almost completely alone. Uh, but then they also, they have the Eucharist together. And the other thing I love is every Monday they would go on a four hour hike. <laughs> so they would all go together, but they would hike in silence. So it was a way of building community without yakking a lot. I would find that to be really interesting. <laughs> would be very good at it, I think. <clears throat> but anyway, so the Carthusians were a, a collective of basically of solitaries. And the tone of the Cloud of Unknowing leads us to believe that this would be the setting in which it was written, and for which it was written. But we're just not sure, it's really interesting. We're pretty sure it was written by a man, but we're not sure about that either. So, and this is all on purpose, he didn't want us to know who he was. And uh, 
So in a way, the authorship being concealed, I think, is really important. But there's one thing he was adamant about, and Patsy and I were talking about this earlier, and that is that this book was not meant to come into the hands of just anybody. It was written for what he would consider to be contemplatives, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but also for people in the active life, and that would be us, who were feeling these stirrings in their soul from the grace of God that were leading them into moments of contemplation that they may not, may not understand. They may not understand what's happening to them. So I think that's really interesting. It's very generous of him. He's not an elitist. He's not saying this is only for contemplatives and closer communities. He's also saying, no, there are people in the act of life who experience what I'm talking about, and this is also for them. But it's not for people who don't have any interest in what he would call this kind of blind stirring of love toward God. So that's, I think, an important aspect. Just to get a sense of the audience, um, and this is not, an, uh, not unique to him, but uh, he has a very nice description of what he means by the active life and the contemplative life, so we can sort of situate this work. On the second page, and I realized after I put these quotes together, I probably should have put this earlier, but on the second page, the third in, uh, paragraph, he goes through the active life and the contemplative life. He says, the lower part of active life standeth in good and honest bodily works of mercy and of charity. That would be very familiar to us, right? <clears throat> the higher part of active life and the lower part of contemplative life, so it's the same thing, lieth in goodly ghostly meditations. I love that line, goodly ghostly meditations, and busy beholding unto a man's own wretchedness with sorrow and contrition, unto the passion of Christ and of his servants with pity and compassion, and unto the wonderful gifts, kindnesses, and works of God in all his creatures, bodily and ghostly, that would be spiritual, with thanking and praising. Okay, you'd think that that would be it, right? What, what more could you do than meditate on the passion of Christ? But he says, but the higher part of contemplation, as it may be had here, and so this is what he's going to be talking about, hangeth all holy in this darkness and in this cloud of unknowing with a loving stirring and a blind beholding unto the naked being of God himself only. Right, so what, you're going to, what he's going to be talking about is a move from contemplating the works of God, contemplating the creatures of God, including ourselves, uh, contemplating the passion of Christ. You're going to leave all of that behind and consider the naked being of God itself, apart from all works, apart from all creation. Now, some would say, you can't do that, right? You can't separate God from God's works. But he thinks that not only can do that, that's what the grace of God allows you to do. That you can actually leave behind everything God ever did, including the incarnation, which is very, you know, that'd be an interesting thing to leave behind, including your own creation, your own status as a creature. You can leave all that behind and just aim directly at God in God's self, right? So that's the goal. Well, he says that when you do this, when you aim, and this is kind of ironic, when you aim solely at God with all of your being and leave all of these other things behind, you enter into the cloud of unknowing. You would think that you would suddenly know everything, right? And instead, you suddenly enter into a land of thick darkness where you don't know anything. And so that's the second paragraph on page one. <clears throat> he says, let not therefore but travail therein, and a let not means don't quit, but travail therein until thou feel list, and that would be desires. For at the first time then when thou dost it, thou findest but a darkness, and as it were a cloud of unknowing, thou knowest not what, saving that thou find, find um, I'm sorry, that thou feelest in thy will a naked intent unto God. Right? So you, you enter a cloud of unknowing, you don't know why, you don't know what, but the one thing you know is that your will has a naked intent toward God. Right? So all you intend is God, but you don't know anything. Right? It's fascinating, actually. Uh, this darkness and this cloud is, however so, so thou dost, betwixt thee and thy God. And let it be that thou mayest neither see him clearly by light of understanding in thy reason, 
nor feel him in sweetness of love in thine affection, and therefore shape thee to hide in this darkness as long as thou mayest, evermore crying after him that thou lovest. Right? So you're, you're to dwell in this cloud of unknowing that you suddenly find yourself in. And notice he thinks that you're going to be surprised by this, right? That you're going to finally intend God alone. And when you do that, you're not going to enter this realm of light and revelation. You're going to enter a cloud, enter a cloud of unknowing. He says, don't freak out, basically, to use my terms. Dwell there, right? And then cry out to God from there. Right? Don't leave it. Don't leave that cloud. For if ever thou shalt feel him or see him, as it may be here, it behooveth always to be in this cloud, in this darkness. Right? So, so it's not something to fear to be in the cloud. It's actually where you should be. In fact, if you could be, you would always be there. But you'd be crying out to the God who is in the cloud. Right? So it isn't like you'd just be satisfied with the cloud. You're crying out in love for the one who is hidden, completely hidden from your understanding in the cloud. Now the scene that he's playing with here is one that we saw with Gregory of Nyssa and also Pseudo Dionysius, whom I said he translated into English. And that's when Moses ascends Mount Sinai and gives the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. And the people then say, we don't want to hear from God anymore. You talk to us, but don't let God talk to us anymore lest we die. So, so he's, he, he now realizes in the tradition that he's receiving revelation from God that's being given to the people, but they can't handle it. So in order to fully experience the revelation of God, Moses goes up the mountain. But what does he enter when he enters goes up the mountain? You'd think it would be like uh, Beijing you know, on a clear day, this beautiful cobalt blue sky. Instead, he enters into the thick darkness where God dwells. Right? So when he goes up to the top of the mountain, he enters thick darkness, and that's where God is. And so the cloud of unknowing is actually unpacking, if you will, in a symbolic way, why it is that when Moses ascends to the height, and he doesn't stay there, right? He ascends there. He enters a cloud of thick darkness. This is also, this, this gets carried on in Israelite tradition. When Solomon dedicates the temple in Jerusalem, he knows that it succeeded in its dedication because a cloud of thick darkness comes into the temple. And he says, that's where God dwells. We know that God is dwelling in this house now because it's thick darkness. So it isn't like you can see God. You see God by the thing that conceals God. I think that's absolutely fascinating, actually. Okay, so how does this work? How can you love a reality you can't know? And that's the dilemma of the whole work, actually. How do you love a reality you can't know? Well, he makes a distinction in the third paragraph on the first page between the knowledgeable power call intellect or reason, and the loving power, which he also calls the will. And right in the middle of the paragraph, he says, <coughs> well, let me see, mm -hmm. yes, and therefore I call them, this, in this case, knowledgeable powers, yet all reasonable creatures, angel and man, have in them each one by himself one principal working power, the which is called a knowledgeable power, and another principal working power, the which is called a loving power. Of the which two powers, to the first, the which is a knowledgeable power, God is the maker of them, is ever more incomprehensible. So God creates us with an intellect and reveals to us that God is incomprehensible to that intellect. Right? I think that's really interesting. So this is very different than previous thinkers who said we're created by reason and will, like Anselm, so that we can know and love God. Uh, the, the author is saying, no, we're, we have this knowledgeable power to which God remains forever incomprehensible. Right? And to the second, the which is a loving power, in each one diversely, he is all comprehensible to the full. We actually saw a move like this, and Bernard of Clairvaux is one of the people lying behind the cloud of unknowing. We saw a move like this last week with Bernard of Clairvaux, where there's a shift from knowing God by the mind to knowing God by love. <clears throat> and, and this author is definitely following in that wake also. So there is a kind of comprehension that takes place, but it's only a comprehension of love, not of intellect. And he thinks this is because the intellect, when you get to a certain phase, the intellect keeps separating you from God because the intellect knows things that aren't God and keeps intruding them into the relationship with God. 
beginning with, for instance, your sins. Right? And so your intellect will remind you, by the way, <laughs> don't forget that in relation to God, you really messed up over and over. And then all of a sudden you think, oh my God, I did. And then you start thinking about the circumstances that would allow you to, meet, uh, to mess up. And then the passion of Christ. But then maybe, you know, not forget. And then, and then you're further and further and further from God. Right? And all of this obsessive thinking about things. So that's the, what he's trying to do is get us to shift from relating to God by our understanding, relating to God, God by what we think, to relating to God solely by love. When we, can, when we find God utterly incomprehensible, and the angels find God utter, utterly incomprehensible, and the highest of the saints find God utterly incomprehensible, but they love God. They love the God they'll never understand. I think it's just an amazing, it's an amazing vision, actually. <clears throat> now what's interesting is he has this concept that this doesn't happen over a progression of time. This happens in what he calls an instant. And it's interesting, we see next time Julian uses exactly the same phrase, I saw God in an instant. And uh, I'm not sure if they're actually talking about the same thing, but it's interesting that that term starts showing up in the late 1300s in England. Um, and so in, the, in that next uh, paragraph, you'll see that this descent into the cloud of unknowing happens sometimes several times an hour, right? So it, it, it's like this, um, it's like an event. It's not like a continuous development. So he says, and therefore, and I love this because he has this very charming metaphor he's gonna use. And therefore take heed to this work, and this work is intending only God and none of God's works or creatures. Attend to this work and to the marvelous manner of it within thy soul. For if it be truly conceived, it is but a sudden stirring it's a sudden stirring that you can't do. This is the grace of God alone. And as it were, unadvised, that means unintended. Like it's a sudden stirring you didn't intend at all. Specially, or speedily springing into God as a sparkle from the coal. I just love that. If you've ever poked a coal fire, you get these kind of sparks going up. And sometimes you don't even have to poke it. A coal fire will actually generate sparks like that. So clearly they were eating the Carthusian houses with coal at this time. <laughs> we know that. But I think that's a marvelous image. So when the grace of God causes the stirring in your soul, and notice at the very beginning, he says, lift up thine heart unto God with a meek stirring of love. That meek stirring of love is actually created by the grace of God. You can't, and I can't do that. But it doesn't happen all the time. It happens in these stirrings, this instant, right? And then suddenly your soul springs up to God as a sparkle from the coal. And it is marvelous to number the stirrings that may be in one hour, right? That may be in one hour wrought in a soul that is disposed to this work. So we can, in fact, cooperate with the grace of God to dispose ourselves to this work for him, but we can't do this. We actually can't transcend creatures and ascend directly with the dark of love to God, unless the grace of God does this in us. And so this is what the grace of God alone can do, and it can do it in anyone, right? So there are people living the act of life who experience in themselves suddenly these moments where they're above everything in the cloud of unknowing. And some of them will actually become Carthusian, right? or become associated with Carthusian houses. Some won't. Some will just live uh, lives in the world, but we'll have these, <clears throat> have these moments when this happens. I think that's really interesting. So what can we do? We can't create these sparks, right? Only the grace of God can create the stirring that creates the spark rising to God. So what can we do? What we can do is put what he calls a cloud of forgetting between us and every creature. And I told my wife this morning that that's what I was going to talk to you about. She goes, you can't do that. <laughs> She's like, and you shouldn't do that. I said, she loves, she loves creatures, especially ravens and crows, and, and actually, especially everything, collies in particular. And she's like, I'm not doing that. If that's, if that's what I have to do to encounter God, I'm not letting go of creatures. So I don't, I don't disagree with her, but, but it's really interesting. So the one thing we can't do is spark up into the cloud of unknowing, right? But what we can do is put between us and everything else a cloud of forgetting, right? So what you, what you have to do is start working on forgetting 
all creatures, forgetting all the works of God, including the passion, including your sin, including Satan, including the angels, including the saints in heaven, all of it. You have to forget all of it. So here you are, you're like Moses on Mount Sinai, and there's a cloud of unknowing between you and God, but now you have to put in a cloud of forgetting for everything beneath you, right? Including, as we'll find later, yourself. You have to forget, most importantly, yourself. Including church. Including church. I know. Including church. Not including your pledge. <laughs> <laughs> but that should be on auto pay anyway, so you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that doesn't go into the cloud of forgetting. That's what you want to keep remembering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is, and you can see then that this is why this is very controversial. Because you're forgetting the church, you're forgetting Christ, you're forgetting the work of creation, you're forgetting everything. You shouldn't think about it. Right? And we would say, you know, in the highest form of the act of life, Contemplating the passion of Christ is the highest thing you can do. We'll see Julian showing, start with her contemplating the crucifix, and then all the showing she has come from that contemplation. Whether she stops there is another question, but so this would be a shocking claim, exactly. That I'm, thank you for bringing that up. Forget the liturgy, forget everything, because all of that is creatures, and what you want is God alone. And so you want to intend that. And so the one thing you can do, and the grace of God will make this possible with your cooperation, is create a cloud of forgetting between you and everything that's not God, and especially, as we'll see later, yourself. Right? So, so you're kind of in this, I, I, when I teach them, I say you're kind of in a sandwich of clouds, right? So there's a cloud of forgetting beneath you, and then that doesn't help you. There's a cloud of unknowing above you. But the thing that separates you from God the most isn't the cloud of unknowing, because that's where God dwells. It's not having a cloud of forgetting. Like the more you remember that which is not God, the more you think about it, the further away from God you are as a contemplative. Right? And he would say, actually, as a human being. <laughs> so, because this work that he's talking about is why God created us. Like this is the work that pleases God the most. And we've talked about this before. The monastics are clear that they think that what they're doing is what human beings were created to do, is to lead this kind of life. Okay, so, so then, it, and the other thing I meant to mention, which I forgot, is that the book itself is being written as though a series of answers to questions that a young man is asking them. And the young man is said to be 24 years old. So it's clearly somebody who's experienced the contemplative life, but has a lot of questions about it. And so and there are times in the reading where it actually comes out, they'll say, you will ask me, right? And so the last paragraph on the first page is this wonderful thing. He says, but now thou askest me and sayest, how shall I think on himself? How shall I think on God? And what is God? Now Anselm had a very good answer to that, right? God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. And this is a couple hundred years before the cloud of unknowing. And to this, I, can, I cannot answer thee, but thus, I want not, I don't know. So here is this contemplative at the summit of the contemplative life, telling this disciple, what is God? I don't know, right? For thou hast brought me with thy question into that same darkness and into that same cloud of unknowing that I would thou were in thyself. So when you ask me, what is God? You take me into the cloud of unknowing, and I don't know. I don't know what God is. For of all other creatures and all their works, yea, of the works of God's self, may a man through grace have full head of knowledge, and well he can think of them, but of God himself can no man think. Right? You can think of everything else, including the works of God, but of God himself you cannot think. And this is a great sentence. And therefore I would leave all that thing that I can think and choose to my love that thing that I cannot think. I'll read that again because it's a killer. <laughs> and therefore I would leave all that thing that I can think and choose to my love that thing that I cannot think. By love God may be begotten and holden, but by thought never. So how do you know that you've come into the cloud of unknowing when you encounter a reality you can't think? It doesn't mean thoughtlessness, right? You're actually trying to think. 
but your thought comes to an end, it fails, but your love doesn't. So you're loving something you can't think, that's God. So I think that's fascinating, actually. God is not that that which nothing greater could be conceived. God is that which you can't stop loving even when you can't understand. So you're, my wife said this morning, that's our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her I'd tell you. <laughs> it's true. I told her, I said, I just don't understand you. <laughs> but I love you, right? She feels the same way. So, so isn't that wonderful, though? You choose your love to love that thing you cannot think. That the most incomprehensible thing is the thing that is the source of your deepest love. Um, really, really something. Now this doesn't mean, as I said, that you ignore in this life the passion of Christ, your own sin, etc. He says, he warns people uh, in the next paragraph not to jump straight to this. You would never jump straight to this. And again, going to David's point about the church, this is where he's protecting himself from you know, being accused of being anti-ecclesial. Um, and he wasn't ever condemned as being a heretic or anything like that. But he does say that, that all of the contemplatives started out contemplating the passion and their own sins and the works of God with thanksgiving, etc. That you don't just go directly to this. And so the next paragraph is meant to show, yea, and so holy, uh, that what man or woman, notice man or woman, that, uh, that we need to come to contemplation without many such sweet meditations of their own wretchedness, the passion, the kindness, and the great goodness and the worthiness of God, coming before, surely he shall err and fail in his purpose. So if you try to ascend this mountain into the cloud of unknowing without considering your own sin and dealing with it penitentially, if you do this without considering the passion of Christ and the great love God has for you, if you do it without thanksgiving for all the works God has done and praising God for everything that God is doing, that's what we would do in church, then you are actually in error. right? So if you go directly to this, you're going to miss it completely. So you can't get up this mountain without the active life and without this form of contemplation of the passion. But then he says, and yet nevertheless, it behooveth a man or a woman, and I do think that's interesting that he's writing for both, <clears throat> that hath long time been used in these meditations, nevertheless to leave them. Right, so if you've been doing this for a long time, leave them behind and put them and hold them far down under the cloud of forgetting, if ever he shall pierce the cloud of unknowing betwixt him and his God, or her and her God. I mean, you, would actually, you could actually say that from what he, what he wrote. So, so it's fascinating, actually, that the, the passion will not carry you up. The love of God and the passion will not carry you up to the cloud of unknowing. You have to put the passion of Christ and your sin and the works of God in creation into the cloud of forgetting before you can enter the cloud of unknowing. Yeah, yeah. Roughly the same. So the question was, who's first, the cloud of unknowing or Meister Eckhart? Yeah. And they're roughly contemporary. So this is a, the, yeah, and both of them are drawing from pseudo Dionysius. So there's a, there's a very strong, in fact, I was going to do Eckhart, uh, but we got ice. <laughs> so I had to adjust the schedule. I thought, do I do Meister Eckhart or do I do uh, cloud of unknowing? And I thought, well, it's him. I mean, it's the Anglican tradition. I mean, the cloud of unknowing is so. Anyway, but that, they're roughly <clears throat> they're roughly contemporary. I don't think he's. In other words, I don't. I think they're drawing from a similar source, which would be pseudo Dionysius. But I don't think. I don't know that. He, we just don't know. I don't see any direct um, dependence on Eckhart in the cloud of unknowing. But there are a lot of family resemblances. So, so it's you can't enter the cloud of unknowing without passing through the sustained meditation on the passion, your own sin, the grace of God, the works of God in creation, the works of God in the church, praising God, thanking God, all of these things, he would say, are absolutely foundational for any man or woman who is on the contemplative path. So you, you can't leapfrog those, because that's how actually the grace of God is reforming you, right? But the grace of God is reforming you to move beyond this, and this of course is where you become controversial, right? You can't, some would say, well, how can you move beyond that? Bernard Clairvaux said the same thing. You go from contemplating the passion of Christ to falling in love with the ascended Christ and the word of God in Christ, right? <clears throat> and then Christ sees the beauty of your soul and falls in love with you, and that leads to your wedding. Um, so in both traditions, you move beyond the passion 
towards something higher. In this one, you don't move to the divinity of Christ the way uh, Bernard of Clairvaux would have you. You move into the cloud of unknowing. Um, so, but you do that by means of putting all this, thank you for that question, you put all the things that he talks about there, your sweet meditations on your own wretchedness, the passion, the kindness, and great goodness, and worthiness of God, etc. You put all that into the cloud of forgetting. That is something you can do, right? In fact, something you must do. So, so the spiritual practice that he would devise the Carthusian or the monk in his or her cell is to practice the cloud of forgetting because you have no control over the cloud of unknowing and you have no control over what happens once you enter the cloud of unknowing but you can control by the grace of God letting behind all created thought uh, and my wife pointed out that this is true this is very similar to Buddhist practice right that especially in the Mahayana tradition what they call shunyata the, the knowledge that everything is empty and you're putting it all out of your mind if you can so one of, one of the texts that is lying behind this is one of Gregory of Nyssa's favorite texts, Gay, thank you for that question. Um, and it's forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to let what lies ahead in Philippians 3. That's the way Paul describes life. That's exactly right. So when you said the, the forgetting is putting it behind you, it's exactly right. So what you're trying to do is clear the area between you and God, right? You're intending God alone. And so anything that's between you and God, you put that behind you. You obviously don't eliminate it because it's always there, but you forget it. So, and you're doing that with your intellect, right? You stop thinking about it. Uh, but that, that's because you're being drawn by grace to love God that you can't know. So you're being drawn into this cloud of unknowing, and you want anything that's not drawing you into that cloud out of the way. And you, can, you do have control over that by the grace of God, he says, that you can, in fact, forget yourself and lose yourself because yourself and everything else is what's getting between you and God. So that was wonderfully said, though, so thank you for that. And it is something that never, it never comes to an end. This process is a continual thing. You see this, um, there's a wonderful quote, uh, Three from the Bottom, where, where you're not just in the cloud of unknown. It's really interesting. It's not just darkness. But if there's any light that's going to come your way, and the, and the, the uh, Mystical theology of Suda Dionysius talks about this too in terms of a ray, a ray that comes from the darkness. Um, in the Cloud of Unknowing, he talks about a beam. He says that, so when you're, when you're in the cloud and you're willing to stay there and you're, and you're practicing the cloud of forgetting of everything that's not God, he says, then God will sometimes peradventure send out a beam of ghostly light, of spiritual light, piercing this cloud of unknowing that is betwixt thee and him, and show thee some of his privity, some of the intimacy of God, if you will, the which man may not nor cannot speak. And this is, of course, his dilemma, is he's talking about something that takes you out of language. Um, then thou shalt feel thine affection inflamed with the fire of his love, far more than I can tell thee or may or will at this time. For of that work that falleth to only God, dare I not take upon me to speak with my blabbering fleshly tongue. <laughs> I just love that line. My blabbering fleshly tongue. So what is language? It's that which you need to put into the cloud of forgetting. Because language is the blabbering fleshly tongue. Right? And so when this light comes to you from the other side of the cloud, and inflames your heart with a love you can't express in words, that's again when you know this is actually divine. Right? If you could put it in language, it's not what he's talking about. Right? But this, this indicates that the cloud of unknowing, God doesn't just dwell in the cloud of unknowing and frustrate you for the rest of eternity, but, but all of this comes only from God. The light that illumines your heart comes only from God. But notice it does not illumine your intellect. It illumines your heart. But God remains incomprehensible, right? But, but, but it also leads your heart and you to transcend your ability to say anything, right? Which I think is really, and I, but I just love that, his blabbering fleshly tongue is left behind. And this means then, and this is the second to the last quote, <clears throat> that the biggest obstacle between us and God is us. Or the biggest obstacle between God and me is myself. Right, because I am the tractor beam that draws all these other things to myself. And I think about all these things. And, 
It's because I'm conscious of myself that I'm thinking about all these things. And what he's saying is you have to leave yourself behind if you want to intend God. You have to leave yourself behind. So he says, therefore, break down all witting and feeling of, the, of all manner of creatures, but mostly busily of thyself. For on the witting that is or knowing, and the feeling of thyself hangeth witting and feeling of all other creatures. For in regard of it, all other creatures be lightly forgotten. In other words, it would be easy to forget all creation if you could forget yourself. Right? So what you have to do is leave yourself behind and, and put yourself in the cloud of forgetting. And he's very clear that's the hardest thing to do. Right? Yeah, Tim? Was well taken. We're using reason to say we can't use reason. That's exactly right. Right. So he's, he's giving you a, a clear intellectual explanation of why the intellect fails. But that would make sense. See, it would actually make sense because this is not God. So we can talk about everything. We, we can talk about everything that's not God, including this. But reading this book isn't what the book is talking about. So yeah, in, in a way, what you're trying to do is lead the intellect to fail, right? And there's the one, there's, pardon me? Presence. Right, the presence, right. So in the presence of God, God is the one thing that will bring your intellect to incomprehensibility. But, but in the next couple of minutes, I do just want to make sure that, that we're clear about what the practicality of this is and the journey that we're making as we start moving to Lent in our world. And that is as we uh, seek to grow into that mind that is in Christ. Um, Cordelia and I were in uh, Baltimore last weekend and seeing a great number of the Buddhist um, uh, collection in the Walker uh, collection and what Buddhism gives us insights into is what the consciousness that this um, that is required in this cloud which is not thinking about God but being with God and that is why Randall in the Mercy Seminar this coming year is talking about Buddhism, um, and this is where we become free as Christians to explore other faith traditions and practices to the, our great benefit because the content of what we have understood in the Christian West in this way has been very poor. We have been impoverished in our mind. It's really hard to go and kill other people in the name of Christ if you have just read the cloud of unknowing. If, however, you are in that lower uh, passion, then there is nothing better than Jesus. And therefore, anything else that is about, that is not about Jesus, should be obliterated. And anybody who is following a path other than Jesus can also quite naturally be obliterated because of course it's all about Jesus and this is a huge anxiety of what happens when we are free from that understanding of our own Trinitarian faith tradition that allows us to have that mind of Christ that is not the mind of Christ, but is the mind of God in Christ's mind. And so what we are doing in this whole contemplative reformation of Christian uh, contemplative spirituality is just this cutting edge. And for that reason, uh, the work that we have of spiritual direction because it's really hard to sit on your own and figure this stuff out. In the monastic community, you had a community that did this. In a parish community, you generally speaking don't. Come back to church next Sunday and figure it out, okay? And if you didn't get it next Sunday, come back the Sunday after and figure it out. We've got to create something in between that is helping us do that. 
and Randall, this is what you are bringing to us. It's really hard. I'm really grateful. Um, Shana and I are here. The Urban Well is here. This is why we're making this practice. And in our contemplative meditation practice in um, uh, the chapel and online, we talk about taking the attention off of ourselves through that mantra prayer, that pure prayer that uses one word to get beyond all words in order to sit in that cloud of forgetting. And maybe there will be a piercing illumination, and maybe not. But the point of the exercise is to love God by being there and in this way. So thank you very much for, um, uh, for just opening this up and feeding us in exactly the way we need to be, even if we're trying to figure out <laughs> what's being fed to us in this way, the way Carrie is in your yeah, breakfast exactly. conversation. So thank you. That, no, that is exactly what we're trying to do, which is to open avenues that are actually there. Like we're not trying to create something that's not there, that the tradition has allowed all sorts of open doors that we haven't taken in a long time. And uh, so it's a it's an indictment of activist Protestantism <laughs> and, <laughs> and activist Roman Catholicism too. I mean, it's been difficult for both traditions uh, to recover these avenues. Um, but I especially appreciated what Tim said because the intellectual work of the cloud of unknowing is absolutely crucial, and there's an irony to the whole thing. And he's, he would say, and I, I really take your point, yeah, you're right, your intellect can master this book. The one thing your intellect will never master is God. And so as long as you think your intellect's in control, it isn't God, right? I think that's really interesting. So that, uh, that goes to that as well, that the hymns and other things can actually open us up to a reality that we can't understand. Right, and, and he would say we could never. No, the, yeah. So the, the the kingdom of God is within us, and our culture encourages us to go outside. It reminds me of Augustine way back in the day when we were talking about the confessions. He says, "You were inside of me, but I was outside of you. I was out in all the beautiful things of the world, which are really beautiful, but I, but you were in me, saying, come home, right? Come home.' <laughs> and so finally, it took him decades to turn around and go, oh." You were there all along. I was gone, right? But so no, that's exactly right. But so many of the readings that we've been doing, including this one, is um, we're distracted with all the things that keep us from God, including works of God, which is really a pretty shocking thing to say. Uh, and that we need to we need to set those things behind and press on in love uh, with a naked intent of will. He says toward the being of God itself. The other thing that they remind us of, and this has been something I've been quite lethal in pointing out <clears throat> all, what all of these people see as the meaning of our life is God, right? What we should focus on is God. And the one thing that the churches today seem to have forgotten is that, right? That they, they have an agenda that's about a lot of other things, which are really, really good things, but what about God, <laughs> right? And so the cloud of annoying is just this, this tractor beam on that issue. <clears throat> Several years ago, there was a survey of Roman Catholics and Protestants who become Pentecostal. And they asked them, why did you become Pentecostal? And they said, because they could teach me about the presence of God and nobody else did. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean there is just, there's a hunger in human beings for this, and we don't feed it very well. So anyway, so yeah, but the cloud of annoying is pretty studded. It's stern food too, so, but it, but it is, it's a, it's a fascinating text. And as David said at the beginning, it has a very long life in England um, to, to this day. I was at a conference in Jerusalem, and a very good friend of mine, a, a modern Orthodox Jewish scholar named Yehuda Gellman, got up and gave a paper, and at the end of it, he exhorted all of his Jewish friends in Israel to read The Cloud of Unknowing. It's like, that's <laughs> <laughs> really, <clears throat> but that goes to David's point. It's one of those texts that builds bridges between communities in ways that other texts do.